Welcome to this new topic entitled Bacterial Metabolism. These are objectives. In your own time, you can go through them. Why is bacterial metabolism is important? Why should we study it? In order for you to know how to inhibit or stop the growth of bacteria, be it in treatment or controlling the growth of this microorganism in the environment, you need to understand the metabolism. Apart from that, you need to know how to identify the bacteria. You can identify a bacteria just by the product of a metabolic reaction or just by utilization of a substrate. You can identify a bacteria based on that. Then in order for you to appreciate the pathogenesis of a disease, because microbes produce certain pathogenic factors that are related to your metabolism. So in order for you to understand pathogenesis, you need to have an understanding of metabolism. Now what is metabolism? Metabolism is the sum of all the biochemical reactions that happen in the living organism. They are divided into two components. Anabolism, which they require energy to synthesize complex molecules from simpler ones. This one is used in repair, reproduction, and growth of a microorganism. Then there are also the group of reactions we call the catabolic reaction. These release energy and they break down complex macromolecules that are already made from other organisms. They break them into simpler ones. And upon breaking them down, they generate energy, which is used for processes such as motility. So if you look at this, is, this is catabolism. The energy generated can be used for transport of nutrients and also for motility. And some of the energy can be used to make the macromolecules that the microbe wants, the microbes of, I mean the macromolecules of interest, making those who require energy, which comes from catabolic reactions. The anabolic reactions, which are simply biosynthetic reactions, these help the microorganism to form macromolecules that are needed for repair, reproduction, and growth. We have already covered the two components of metabolism, but one thing you need to understand that these biochemical reactions that we focus on under metabolism, they are those that are used to generate energy. And we have already said that catabolic reactions are the ones that generate energy. Meaning our focus is on catabolic reactions. So the actions that are used to make energy are those that fall under aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, and fermentation. So these three processes are the ones that microbes use to generate energy, depending on whether a bacteria grows anaerobic, anaerobic, or not. So it depends on whether it can grow under aerobic, anaerobic conditions, or under both. Any of these processes will be used to generate energy. So in energy production, what processes do bacteria use? So we have said this aerobic respiration, anaerobic, and fermentation. Now each of these processes have what we call the pathways. So anaerobic respiration uses glycolysis, the TCA cycle, and the electron transport chain. Same as aerobic respiration. But for fermentation, only glycolysis is used. So our focus in this lecture, please try to understand what these processes are. How is energy produced in bacteria or in microbes? Production of energy involves the oxidation of reduced molecules, meaning molecules that contain electrons, that are rich in electrons. And among the most, the most rich macromolecules are the carbohydrates and the lipids. 
So these macromolecules, because they contain electrons, they are reduced. And when you oxidize them, meaning you cause them to lose electrons, they release energy and electrons. So they release the electrons and the energy, meaning you oxidize them. So you need to understand that the energy that is released during catabolism, catabolism of these macromolecules, the energy is trapped and used to form high energy bonds in the form of ATP and GTP or another high energy compound. So formation of this happens during substrate phosphorylation, meaning during the breakdown of the macromolecule itself, you can form some ATP using some energy that is generated right there and then you can use that energy to form ATP or GTP. We refer to that process of forming these high energy bonds as substrate phosphorylation. Then the electrons that are released, they are trapped by coenzymes. Remember, these electrons, they move with energy. So even the electrons that are trapped by these coenzymes, they are used to form more energy in the electron transport chain. So NADH and FADH will be saving to trap electrons that are coming from the reduced macromolecules as they are being oxidized. So electrons from the coenzymes, NADH and FADH2, is used to generate ATP. So NADH, when it is sent to the electron transport chain, it can generate up to 3 ATP. Then FADH2 can generate up to 2 ATP. So for a molecule of glucose, for example, in glycolysis, it will just generate up to 2 ATP. But when you look at the maximum, it can generate about 38 ATP. So much of those ATP come from the oxidation of NADH and FADH2 during the process we call oxidative phosphorylation. Then you need to understand at the end of these reactions, there is a molecule that accepts the electron. So in aerobic respiration, the terminal electron that accepts is oxygen, and in the anaerobic respiration, it is a sulfur radical or nitrogen. Then in fermentation, it is an organic molecule, which is a final electron as accepted. So as you can see, these are the electron acceptors. In aerobic respiration, it's O2. Anaerobic, these are the ones. Fermentation, this is the one. Then for us to understand how these things happen, we need to just look at one process that involves all the pathways. And this process is aerobic respiration. So as we have said, under this one, the electron acceptor, final electron acceptor, is oxygen, which is reduced to, to water. And we have said it uses three pathways. Now the question is, how does this happen? So when you have one molecule of glucose, this molecule of glucose will be oxidized to pyruvic acid. And during that process, it will generate two ATP through the process of substrate phosphorylation. Then it will also generate two NADH, which can be sent in the electron transport chain here, where it will generate more ATP. So glycolysis is the first pathway in aerobic respiration. The end product, which are two pyruvic acids, they are, set, they are modified to two acetyl air, which are sent in the electron transport, in the TCA cycle, or the Krebs cycle, which generates more NADH and more FADH2, which are also sent finally in the electron transport chain. So we are talking about beginning with glucose and ending with water. All of these processes are what we refer to as aerobic respiration. So if you end at glycolysis, it is not complete. If you end at the TCA cycle, it is not complete until you reach the electron transport chain. Now you notice that even anaerobic respiration also uses three pathways. The difference is that anaerobic respiration skips some stages in the TCA cycle, meaning the number of ATP that it generates are less than, are always less than what aerobic respiration generates. So aerobic respiration generates 38 ATP, and anaerobic it is always less than this. 
Then for fermentation, since it only uses glycolysis, the maximum ATP generates are just two ATP molecules. So as you can see, at the end of glycolysis, you have two pyruvic acid, two NADH, and two ATP. Okay, so when you go to the TCA cycle, the two products, the two pyruvic acids from, TC, from the glycolysis are modified to acetyl-CoA A and they enter the TCA cycle. Once they enter, they are capable of generating two ATP through substrate phosphorylation and six NADH, two FADH2, and four molecules of carbon dioxide. So what you need to understand is that when you convert this NADH to ATP, you should convert it by multiplying this by three and this one by two. So you need to understand that the TCA cycle also generates only two ATP molecules, meaning the TCA cycle plus glycolysis, they can only generate four ATP through substrate phosphorylation. But when they send their coenzymes, all of them, when they send their coenzymes to the electron transport chain, they are capable of generating more ATP, 34 ATP from the electron transport chain. So this is a TCA cycle. In your own time, you can just try to appreciate how NADH is being formed and how FADH is formed and also how these coenzymes are formed and sent in the electron transport chain. So the electron transport chain occurs within the cell membrane and you need to understand that the electron transport chain is very similar to the hydroelectric power generation as you will observe from the next diagram. So what we're having here, for example, is this coenzyme NADH, which we formed in glycolysis and in the TCA cycle. Then we also have this FADH2, which we formed in the TCA cycle. We have now brought them in the electron transport chain. So they will get oxidized to become this and that. And by getting oxidized, they will lose the electrons. Those electrons will flow through proteins that contain electrons that contain metals within them, those we call the cytochromes. They will transfer the electrons up to the final electron acceptor. So if it's aerobic respiration, the final electron acceptor will be oxygen, as you can see there, which will finally be changed to water. The other thing you need to understand is that these electrons, as they move, they move together with hydrogen, hydrogen ions. So they meet oxygen, they form water. So since oxygen is standing at the end here and receiving the, electron, the electrons, we refer to it as the final electron acceptor in aerobic respiration. So if this was an aerobic respiration, maybe what can be is of a radical, that's what you can have there. Or nitrogen, any of those can serve as a final electron acceptor. But for aerobic, it is always oxygen that serves as the final now this is how energy is formed. So when this coenzyme is oxidized, meaning it has become NAD now, as you can see it does not have the hydrogen at the end, meaning it is oxidized, the electrons it forms will flow down this gradient, down that gradient, down that gradient. So at each gradient, these electrons that they flow, they are capable of forcing ADP to combine with inorganic phosphates to form ATP. So this happens at three positions. That is why NADH generates three ATP. For FADH2, when it gets oxidized to FAD, it's capable of losing electrons that creates two gradients. Those gradients, each of them, are capable of generating one ATP molecule. So one ATP here, one ATP here, meaning the maximum you can generate from FADH2 is to ATP molecules. So this is what we are talking about. So if you are talking about aerobic respiration, during glycolysis, when you convert your glucose to pyruvate, you will form two NADH, and you also form two ATP, and at the start of the reaction, you use two ATP, 
So when you subtract the two ATP you use, you end up with a two ATP. They need to be two because you use two molecules of ATP at the beginning here to just activate glycolysis. So then you subtract two from there, meaning you will have two ATP as a net. Then these two NADH that you generate, they are capable of producing six ATP. If you multiply two by three, you get six ATP. Then for the two pyruvate molecules that are formed, when they are converted to two acetyl A and sent in the electron transport chain, they are capable of one. When converting pyruvate to acetyl A, you generate two NADH, which can also which are also sent in the electron transport chain and they generate 6 ATP. Then during the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, two GTP, which are just the same as ATP, are formed through the process of substrate phosphorylation. Then during the same Krebs cycle, six NADH molecules are formed. When you multiply this by three, you get 18 ATP. Then two FADH2 molecules that are formed, when you multiply this by two, you get for ATP. Now when you add everything, all the nets, you get 38 ATP. So in a bath that you makes energy by aerobic respiration, is capable of generating 38 ATP molecules just from one molecule of glucose. So this bacteria grows under aerobic respiration. So you need to understand that anaerobic respiration Bacteria that grow under anaerobic conditions can use anaerobic respiration. There are differences between anaerobic and aerobic. The main difference lies in the final electron acceptor. And the final electron acceptor differs according to the bacteria. As you can see, method of genes, they use this. So the monas, they can use even a nitrate radical. Please understand. Then fermentation, remember we said fermentation only uses glycolysis. So the two NADH that are formed in glycolysis, they are actually used to react with the end product, which is pyruvic acid, to convert it to either the alcohol or an acid in order to regenerate the oxidized form of NADH, which is NAD. So this is recycled in glycolysis. So you need to understand, because the pyruvic acid is the one that reacts with this coenzyme that trapped the electron during glycolysis, we refer to the pyruvic acid as a final electron acceptor. So if you look at this diagram, for example, this is like glycolysis, glucose, pyruvic acid, and you are generating the NADH here. In some bacteria, this pyruvic acid is changed to ethyl alcohol. How do they do it? They first convert to acetaldehyde, then they react it with this NADH that was formed to convert it to ethyl alcohol. So some bacteria form alcohols. Then some of them, this pyruvic acid, they will react it directly, directly with NADH to form lactic acid. So this is fermentation. So if you add a pyruvic acid, it is not fermentation, it's glycolysis. But when you convert pyruvic acid to alcohol or to an acid, then you are fermented. So these are just some of the examples of the products that bacteria form after they have carried out fermentation. As I said, end products of metabolism may differ from bacteria to bacteria. So please try to go through all these things that I've just talked about. And in your own time, Try to answer these questions by completing these tables that I've put at the end.